the heart of today's message that I really felt like God impressed upon me in just prayer time and just meditating on the scriptures was that, you know, we don't need more Christians with information. Information's great. It's always awesome to know that you are equipped and you are ready at a moment's notice for whatever someone might bring a question of or um, something that you encounter in life. But more so than information, we as believers need transformation. We need transformation deep in our hearts. Because you can know something here and really not believe it. That's just going through the motions. And myself included, I've been in many moments of my life with my faith and my walk, even my marriage, and multiple different areas of life where it's been going through the motions because I hadn't received transformation. I'd just been going through the information that I had. So that's really the heart of today's message. And it's piggybacking off of last week with Pastor Chris talking about Jesus and really the essence that his greatest miracle, he did a ton. And in Mark, we've seen so many highlighted. But his greatest miracle is that he actually chose to stay on the cross. He chose to stay on the cross for us. He had every ability, he's God in flesh, to come off of that cross and not go through what he went through. But he actively chose as obedience to his Father and out of love, a deep, deep love that we never will fully grasp for us, chose to stay on that cross. And it wasn't just that he stayed on the cross, but it was that he actually drank, and this is, it goes back to this Old Testament idea of the cup of God's wrath. He actually drank the cup of God's wrath for our sin for us, so we did not have to. And so we pick up right in the midst of this mini-series about passion, which is a word I so deeply love, but also pick up right in the middle of Jesus' payment for our sins, for our brokenness. And so just speaking about that passion mini-series, it got me thinking, well, what is passion? What is is even the definition of passion? Because it's something we hear a lot about when you have a lot of it or lack thereof. Uh, I've I've been told that extroverts are the only ones that have passion and introverts don't. Um, I don't think that's true. But passion really is, when being defined as a noun, it is the week leading up to Jesus's, uh, and the events leading up to Jesus's death. But also, in a non-religious sense, it's that it is a ardent affection. An ardent affection. Interesting. So it has to do something with love. So what is the opposite, I started to think, of passion? Because some people tell you they don't, aren't passionate about certain things. Well, the opposite is apathy. What is apathy? Apathy is the absence of passion, excitement, emotion. And that got me thinking again. Interesting. These two things juxtaposed. And I really feel like in this time of life, even more so with this pandemic, with all of this different kind of stuff going on. Um, the biggest hurdle or obstacle that believers are facing is apathy. A lack of passion, a lack of excitement or emotion in response to the overwhelming love that Jesus poured out on the cross. And it's not that You have to be the crazy person who hops up on a stage or goes on a campus to go tell people about it and put themselves out there. But it's understanding that we all are passionate about something because we all are lovers. We've been created by love, for love, to love. Because that's how God designed us. He created, he is love, so he created us. We're created by love. He created us for love. He created us to receive his love eternally. And we're created to love, to actually give that love to others. So before we even move on, just taking a self-assessment, what are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? Some people are passionate about their hobbies. 
Some people are passionate about their family. Some people are passionate about a sport. I would fall in that category. (laughs) And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But how much or how many people would say they are passionate about Jesus? Are passionate about sharing the love that we've received through Jesus' death on the cross with others. Because I think about the things I'm passionate about. I I think about my wife. I'm passionate about my wife. And you know what? Everyone knows that she is my wife and I'm married. I don't hide that because I'm passionate, right? I think about football. I am passionate about football. Love that game. Everyone knows that either I played it, coach it, or just love it. Like, it just is what it is. So I'll ask you guys this. How do you guys show that you are passionate? Because it's different for everybody. I talk a lot. Other people don't talk a lot. But everyone is passionate about something. And everyone has a way of expressing it. So as you think through that, we're going to get into the scriptures and really dive into what are we actually passionate about as Jesus followers. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 47. The words will also be on the screen. Um, And this is something that's going to be a little bit out of the ordinary, but I'm actually going to ask that we stand as we read it together. Um, This isn't just a religious ritual, but I think that this is a way that we actually can honor God and honor the scriptures that he actually teaches us and speaks to us through. Amen? Can we, so can we stand as we read? <clears throat> as you turn there, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. It says in verse 33, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So that's about noon until 3 p.m. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi. Lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. I imagine there's a little sarcasm in there. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, He asked him whether he was already dead. And when Pilate learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out from the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. This is the word of the Lord. You guys can take your seats. Uh, Father... I just pray that these would not just be words on a page or good advice, but God, I pray that this would be the power of the gospel to transform our hearts, because you know that it starts with us before it ever starts in a city or in a nation. So God, we ask that uh, you would speak, that we would hear your word. God, I must decrease that you would increase, and we ask that you would speak to us this morning. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. It's interesting, you know, kind of thinking about this moment in time, 
because so often us as believers, uh, and even non-believers, especially being in the United States uh, with its Judeo-Christian background, they've heard of this at the very least. But it is so much more than just a story. For us believers, it is literally the power of God that saves us. The gospel is not just a funky, you know, old term or word to use, but the gospel literally means good news. It's the good news of King Jesus that he paid the ultimate price that we could not so that we could be in a relationship that we could not be in with, on our own strength, but only through Jesus. And it's, it's, it's meant to actually change us at our deepest level, not our personality, not who we are created to be, but it's actually meant to change our heart, our mindsets, our views on reality, how we see, perceive, filter things. When we actually accept this good news, we're actually accepting the reality that God says, which is actually the reality, not the one that we see or experience. And we say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that. I'm aligning myself with that. I'm passionate about that. And so that's, that's what it is. It's the, it's the transformative power that starts with us, goes to a city, goes to a community, and goes to a nation. So the Gospel of Mark is interesting because it was written with a Roman audience in mind. It was written to non-Jewish people, i.e. us. And what's interesting about it is that it's the shortest gospel, but it is probably the best highlight reel that I've ever seen. I myself have produced many a highlight reels over my football career. Uh, I've also watched quite a few and seen others. And the thing about a highlight reel is you want to obviously put on the best plays, the best things that you can do. And Mark felt compelled by the Holy Spirit to do that for Jesus. And so the gospel of Mark is intended to go to a non-Jewish audience showing the very best and powerful of who Jesus is. The, the word that continually gets used in Mark's gospel is euthys, E-Y, sorry, E-U-T-H-Y-S. And it's a Greek term that can be translated to immediately, immediately. And in the 16 chapters of Mark, it's used 41 times. That's almost three times a chapter. Immediately, immediately, immediately. What is all this getting to? So a Roman audience in mind, a non-Jewish audience in mind, a highlight reel, and the use of immediacy, the use of urgency, the use of right away something happens. What is it getting to? It's getting to the idea that Mark is claiming that Jesus holds, has, and is the most powerful man because he's also God, that has ever walked this earth, and there's no one beside him. Thinking, again, writing to a Roman audience that is very much like our culture today. Thousands of gods, a pantheon of gods who are always warring for the top spot. A, a litany of viewpoints and expressions that were okay and accepted and all those different kind of things. No real absolute statement of truth. Sound familiar? To me, it sounds like a college campus. But Mark said, no, 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 no. There is an absolute. His name is Jesus. He holds it all. He's the most powerful, and here's why. Here's 16 chapters as to why. Miracle after miracle after miracle, culminating with the greatest miracle, his death on a cross. And so then you even look at the account itself of Jesus' death. You look at some of the notable characteristics. Darkness covered the entire land. People die all the time. I don't see it getting dark outside. 
I don't, see, I don't see the sun in the middle of the day just covering up for no reason when a certain person died. But it did for Jesus. You, you look at the fact that he, he yells out with such an interesting cry that a Roman centurion who was in charge of this kind of thing, had seen it before, had, had witnessed crucifixions multiple times, was so moved by the way this certain man died that he claimed he was the son of God. You, you look at the curtain in the temple, which was about six inches, give or take, six inches thick, that separated the general area of the temple between the Holy of Holies where only God's presence resided and only a, the, the top priest, the high priest, could go in once a year to even be in that presence. And right when Jesus died, the veil, six inches thick, was torn in two completely from top to bottom. What the heck? It's crazy. And then you even think of Joseph of Arimathea, who was there witnessing a guy who was a part of a group that actually conspired to murder Jesus because he was too much of a threat to their power. And he gets a whole new perspective shift. So everything about this account is saying, hey, listen up. Look at this. Jesus Everything about him leading up to this and even the way he died signifies that there is something so transcendent about him, so much more powerful about him. None of these other things in this world can touch it. None of these other viewpoints, none of these other deities, none of these other ways of thinking or ways of behaving can even remotely come close. That's pretty powerful. And that's the power that gets to transform us. That's the power of the gospel. It's, uh, it's interesting because so many people look at Christianity or they look at the gospel as a great motivator or a great add-on or a, a great moral ethic to strive to in order to be a good person. And none of that's wrong, but it's a half-truth. It's not the full truth. 30% of a truth is not the, is not the whole truth. Although there's a nugget in there. It's great. The reality is, is that the gospel, the love of Jesus poured out on the cross for us, is the only thing that one can save us to, become in right, to be in right relationship with God. It's the only thing. But it also allows us for the very first time to actually know who God is because we actually can seek him and follow him, and through that actually know who we are at our very core. Because we're made in the image of God, and if we're made in the image of God as we pursue him, we actually figure out who we are. <clears throat> and that's what transformation is. It's getting rid of all the junk. It's getting rid of all the overlying uh, stuff that that keeps us from actually understanding who we are. And we couldn't get rid of that on our own, but Jesus can. So as we move through this, I just got to thinking, man, there's so many different types of people. There's so many different ways that people have lived, have experienced things. There, there's people who have done things that are wrong, who have done things that... Have, have experienced sin. I know I have. I'm definitely in that category. There's also people who have experienced things that were wrong done to them. All of it's a product of sin. And everyone needs transformation. And so the two characters, and they're real people. This is, a, this is a historically verified event. But the two characters in this story that stood out to me was Joseph of Arimathea and the Roman centurion. So let's start with Joseph. Like I said earlier, Joseph was a man who was a part of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee. The Sanhedrin was the religious council of the day. Think elite of the elite. He's, like, he's, he's one of the top dogs. He has studied. He has worked. 
He has, from the young age of early teens, probably 13 or so, he has devoted his entire life to the study of Scripture, to the point where he actually memorized, because Pharisees had to do this, memorized the entirety of the Old Testament. Could just quote it. Could speak it for chapters upon chapters out of memory. I could maybe memorize 100 plays let alone an entire Old Testament. But that's what he did. And he was waiting for the kingdom of God. He wanted to know that the kingdom of God had come. He'd been preparing for it. And yet, he almost missed that coming when he saw Jesus. But what's interesting, and the phrase that I'd love for you guys to look in on, is it says that he went to Pilate because he took courage. He took courage. Two words right there in verse 37. I was like, hmm, what does that even, what does it mean to take courage? It actually means to assume it. It's not just something that happened to him. It wasn't just something that uh, he happened into. It was that he actually said, I don't know if he said this, but he had to have said to himself, I'm going to become courageous. And I'm going to go ask Pilate for Jesus' body. What's so profound about this is that it was Joseph actually saying, I'm going to turn my entire back on everything I'd ever known. The Pharisees were against Jesus. Jesus was claiming to be God in flesh. And he wasn't what the Pharisees wanted him to be. So much so that they murdered him on a cross. And here's Joseph saying, no. I've been transformed. There's something about this Jesus guy that the way he even died lends credence to what he said prior. I actually believe that he is the Son of God. So I'm willing to follow him. I'm willing to go against my coworkers, my friends, my family, the elite social status that I have in order to follow Jesus. And what I can do, I can give him a tomb. I, I, I can show him honor. I can show him respect. I can actually show my passion and my love for this man through serving him. Now I've, <clears throat> in my own life, experienced moments where I've had to make that decision. I think we all have, if we've walked with Jesus long enough. Even the act of following Jesus for most of us was that kind of decision. But what ways could you identify with Joseph? Joseph. Has, has there been a point in your walk with Jesus where he didn't meet your expectations? <laughs> that's, that's plenty of mine. Has it, has it been a moment where you were, you were wanting it to look a certain way? You were wanting everything to go up and to the right when you started accepting Jesus without any issues, without any letdowns, so to speak, without any kind of hills and valleys and mountaintop experiences and the deep, deep, dark places? I don't know. I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. Yeah. So in what ways could you identify with Joseph? Because we all can. We've all had moments where I have to make a decision to either go against my, own, my old thought process, my old mentality, my family's way of doing things, my uh, even significant others' way of doing things in order to follow Jesus. So that's one person that experienced transformation in this story. But before I go to the next one, I just want to encourage you that God doesn't leave you in those places. He doesn't leave you in the valley confused, wondering what's going on with your faith deconstructed and all that different kind of stuff. But Psalm 23 says that even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you'll fear no evil. 
for your rod, David, the author, saying to God, your rod and your staff comfort me. That rod and that staff was a way for the shepherds of the day to take their flock down into a valley by a very narrow route up against the cliff face so that the rod and staff kept the sheep from falling off down in the valley. How good of a God do we have that he would actually keep us from falling off deep into the valley without him, but walk us through the valley that we were inevitably going to face anyway, but actually walk us through it and actually have us be transformed on the other side of it. So loving. Doesn't seem like it in the moment, but it's so loving. I, I know even in the past year and a half, I've experienced that, where it seems like such a chastisement. It seems like God's punishing me, or there's some kind of correction, but he's really not. He's just not letting me fall off, the, fall off into the valley. Because I, I didn't see it. It looks like I'm going the right way, but, but he knows that it's not the right way. And so, yeah, in the moment, it hurts my ego, it hurts my pride, but it's actually loving. And just thinking back to Joseph, Jesus never scolded him. God didn't smite him or anything like that because he almost missed it. He actually transformed his heart because he loves him. And then there's the second character, the Roman centurion. Like I said earlier, he knows what this is like. He knows what crucifixion is like. He, he's seen it before. He's, even while Jesus is being crucified, there's two criminals on his left and his right. So it was a common practice for the day. But Jesus, a different guy, a sign above Jesus' head singing, saying, King of the Jews. The Roman centurion had seen this man whipped, scourged, beyond recognition. He saw this man be crowned with a crown of thorns. He saw this man be given purple linen as, as a king. He literally saw this man in a mocking gesture, but still nonetheless coronated as a king. And then he lets out this cry. The Roman crucifixion was not designed for people to be able to do something like that. The way Roman crucifixion was designed was that your body was put in a position where in order to breathe, you had to actually push yourself up off of the nails that you were hung on in order to get a breath, and then you'd sink back down because of gravity, and every time you do that, it feels good for a moment, and then you go back down, and then you start to actually choke on the fluid in your lungs. People in crucifixion didn't die from the brutality of it. They died from the asphyxiation of choking on their own fluid in their lungs. And so for Jesus to be able to let out a loud cry as he passes, and in other gospels, him saying, it is finished, it wasn't just that he had finished what he had set out to do. It wasn't just that, although he did, it wasn't just that he was done living. It wasn't just that he had finished drinking the cup of God's wrath. But he said, it is finished because I'm the victor. Because I'm the most powerful one. Because I have secured salvation for my people. And this Roman centurion is like, what the heck? He's not even supposed to be able to do that, let alone say something like that. And as he gives up his spirit, this Roman centurion is like, the only, the only logical explanation. The sign says king of the Jews. Everything else points to being a king. What he just did is unlike I've ever seen before. Truly. This man was the son of God. Truly. And uh, 
and I really believe that the Roman centurion for us, and this, using it as a, as a metaphor, again, historical reality, it really happened, but using him as a metaphor, he represents the world. The world's systems, the world's structures, the world's ways of thinking. <clears throat> and how many Christians live a life that just blends in? That just blends in. Doesn't rock the boat. Doesn't ruffle anybody's feathers. There's nothing distinguishable about their belief system or their love for one another or their love for their fellow man. There's nothing distinguishable about what they believe. They just kind of float on by. The world's not going to respond to something like that because there's plenty of ways that you can live life and just chill and be good. But at its essence, Christianity's not that because we're following a Jesus who died like this. We're following a Jesus who said, even in my death, I'm still saying, I'm the guy. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, not a way, the way, the truth, the life. If anyone wants to come to the Father, come to God, come through me. And he displayed that on the cross. And the world, as much as we hear on a college campus or even in a city like Eugene, the world says, hey, just coexist. Hey, don't, don't rock the boat. You know, like, what's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me. Like, it's all, you know, chill. Jesus didn't die for that. He didn't just die to create another way to have a good, wholesome life. Although, thankfully, God wants to bless us because he loves us. Jesus died to actually save us, set us free, transform us, actually experience what life and life abundantly is. It's getting off of the wheel, the rat race, getting off of it and actually going somewhere, not just going through the motions, not just having to earn salvation, not just having to earn love, not just having to wonder, oh, I'm trying to prove myself to that person who's trying to prove themselves to that person who's trying to prove themselves to that person, and you'll never, ever measure up anyway. He died to have the certainty that I am so loved by God. With all my junk, with all my brokenness, with everything that I've ever done, at the very worst of who I am, Jesus loved me for all that I am. At the worst of who I am, Jesus loved me for all that I am. And he died for me. That's a message that can actually distinguish some people. That's a message that can actually shift and change a city. Not out of compulsion, because the church has not been having a great track record with that over the thousands of years since its, its existence. It's not out of compulsion. It's not out of force. But it's out of a loving relationship that we have with God because of what Jesus did that so moves us to love other people to the point where we will share with them, hey, you're believing one reality and here's what that truth is. And I don't have to come at you, you know, with hellfire and brimstone, but I can share with you the reality of that if you're separated from God, it leads to death. But if you are with God, if you're in relationship with him through Jesus, that's what brings life. And the Roman centurion saw that wrapped up in Jesus and how he died. Growing up in San Diego, I have a lot of uh, friends who are part of the Latter-day Saint Church, can know, know them as Mormons. Um, incredible people. Some of, some of my best friends growing up, I'd go to their house, I was like their eighth son, you know, so I was like, it's cool. You know, it's like, it's awesome. Uh, I actually had one family who was like eight kids deep, so it was pretty crazy. Um, but, you know, as I grew up with them, and even into college, I heard this a lot too, I always heard them say, man, Quinn, you'd be such a good Mormon. Like, what the, what the heck does that even mean? Like, good Mormon? Like, okay, like, all right, thanks for the encouragement. Appreciate it. And that's not, I'm not tooting my own horn because I'll share in a minute, but I asked him one time, I asked a buddy in college, I was like, what do you mean I'd be a good Mormon? 
He's like, whoa, man, like, you don't do drugs. You don't sleep with your girlfriend. You don't, you know, you do good in school. Like, you're good at sports. Like, you look put together. Like, you just be a good Mormon. And I left that conversation, and I was like, is that all it is? It, is, is that all it is to, to, to my friends? Like, is just look good on the outside, and you're good? Because little did they know, inside I was addicted to pornography. I was, you know, because I was afraid of sinning, I didn't ever have sex, but I was trying to do whatever, anything with whoever, without a care in the world. I... I was trying to earn salvation. I was trying to earn love and acceptance and affirmation through just being a good kid, and I prized my reputation more than anything else. So I looked like I had it all together, but internally, I was totally not. My wife knows this because I, um, I shared with her before we got married and stuff. You know, when I went off to college, I said, awesome, now it's my time to live my life because I had been a pastor's kid, and I had been having to hold, uphold this reputation and all this stuff. And I was like, great, now I get to live my life. I'll go 2,500 miles away from home. I will do whatever I want, and I'll live however I want. And I'm thankful I met my now wife as a senior in high school, because I realized if I wanted to date her that I couldn't actually do that. But there was no, there was no transformation of my heart of my desires, of my mindsets, of my, of my being. It was all a have to. Rather than actually experiencing the love of Jesus poured out on the cross, the actually receiving it and saying, you know what, I'm not going to hold on to my pride and try to make sure I have something to say about my own salvation. No, no, no. I'm actually going to humble myself and receive the love that Jesus poured out for me and experience transformation. It wasn't until I did that that all of it made sense. It went from a have to, to a get to, to a want to. It was no longer, okay, I'm told X, Y, and Z rules from this book that I see, I guess, benefits people, to now, oh my gosh, I'm so loved that the most loving thing I could do out of a response for that is just follow what Jesus said. It's not rocket science, it's, but it's still hard. <laughs> the gospel is one of the most simple things that exists, but it's so deep and profound and it's so hard for us as humans that we make it complicated. And so today, where are you guys at with that walk? And it's an encouraging question, I hope, hope that it comes out that way because whether you are just hearing this message for the first time, the message of the gospel, or whether you're hearing it for the hundredth time, there's always another level of grace that we can receive. There's always another depth to God's love, to God's grace, to who he is, to who we are called to be that we can follow again. And maybe for the first time you're hearing it. And it's like, I don't even know what the heck this gospel thing really is. I mean, I heard what you said with, from this book, but what is the gospel? Here it is in a nutshell. In the beginning, God created humanity. He created humanity out of a love that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had for one another. But humans chose to define good and evil for ourselves and rejected God's definition of good and evil. And when we did that, separation came. That separation is what we call sin. And that separation, that sin, is what leads to death, eternally. But God, again, because of his love, and it always comes back to love. If the gospel is not rooted in love, it's not the gospel, because of God's love for us, he did not desire for eternity without us. He wanted eternity with us. He wanted a relationship with us. That he actually sent his son in the form of a man named Jesus to live the life that we could never live. We were, in order to be in relationship with God, we had to live a perfect life and nobody can. But Jesus came and lived that perfect life. 
Then Jesus died the death, the eternal death, and the physical death on the cross that we deserve to die because of our separation, our sin from God. And then he rose. Thank God for Easter. He rose three days later, not only proving what he said was true and who he was was true, but also finally defeating death for eternity, defeating the grave, and securing our salvation. And so now if we just trust in who Jesus is and who he said he is, and we make him our Lord and follow him, we're saved and in right relationship with God. It's not hard. It's quite simple. But it's not easy. And so that's what I want to leave with you guys this morning, is that first and foremost, the gospel transforms us. Then it transforms a community. Then it transforms a a nation. And in a place like Eugene, where we all can say that it can be very dark at times, spiritually, even mentally, what greater way to love our city, to love our neighbors, to love our friends, than to actually let our light shine the brightest? To actually live a distinguishably different life from the rest of the people around us. That doesn't mean that we look down upon. That doesn't mean that we cast judgment. But what it does mean is that we know the truth, we live by it, and we love by it. We live by it, and we love by it. And so I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to ask that we uh, bow our heads and close our eyes as I pray us out. I'm actually going to ask you to do something. If, If you're here for the first time, or you're here for the hundredth time, but, but you feel like maybe you've been distant from God or anything like that, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. And after the service, I'd love to pray with you, um, meet with you, talk with you, and just explain what it really means to follow Jesus. And if you do raise your hand, you're saying, I'm following Jesus, and I want to be in relationship with God through following Jesus. And I trust that he is my Lord and Savior. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for this moment. We thank you that you were not just content to let us uh, die and never be with you eternally, but you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, to die on the cross to to, to, to fill the gap that we created through our sin. And Father, I just ask right now that your Holy Spirit would just touch the hearts of these people as they've been listening. We thank you that uh, we know you're doing that. So if that's you in this place. If you have never uh, made the decision to follow Jesus or you want to remake that decision, I'm just asking that you put your hand up at this time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God, that you see those hands. God, I thank you that you you love us so much. And we ask that, yeah, you would continue to show us the depth of your love for us, the depth of your grace, and that we could never run out or ever fully understand it, so we're going to continue to pursue you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you did, Jesus. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for checking out our YouTube video today. We appreciate you taking the time to tune in with us. Before you take off, please hit the like button. And if you want more of this content and you want to be notified when we put out new videos, hit the subscribe button and the little bell for notifications right next to it. We'll look forward to seeing you next time.